worked with executives and leaders at, at Fortune 500 companies, the federal government, college and universities, and sporting organizations. His writing has appeared in CNBC, World Economics Forum, Thrive Global, and he is one of the top writers for Medium.com. He has appeared as a guest on ABC TV and XM Radio programs. Uh, Christopher is highly sought saw after speaker among the millennials and professionals in the business academy and sports world. His core message of building a game plan on core values uh, resonates with thousands. Oh, fun. You live in Charleston. He lives in Charleston, South Carolina with his amazing wife and proud father of two robustious baseball-loving boys. So, Christopher, welcome uh, to, to our Sunday. And so we walked over to me with a smile, and he could see how nervous I was, and he said, Hey, 
I got your suit. Don't forget that. And don't forget to have fun. Good luck on the interview. So it was one of those moments for me, as there have been many uh, throughout my life, flying, staying in hotels, all along the way, I've been touched by some pretty wonderful people in travel. And what I've come to realize is that how many of you and how many special people in this industry make things so easy and so good for people like me. So many of you are just such intrinsically good people. And so it's an honor here to be among friends and people that have made my life easy as I forgot many things along the way. Wanted to transition into uh, the life of a man that unfortunately we recently lost at the beginning of this month. Someone whose authentic leadership and incredible values-based leadership did so much to transform the airline industry, but also someone who is a truly amazing CEO and leader that we can learn so much from. What made her Kelleher so great and has been identified by so many of the people that work for Southwest Airlines, and as I flew it in here even had it further validated, was that he always put people first. Herb Kelleher was an authentic leader. He led with values. And one of the first things that he did when he took over at Southwest Airlines was establish a vision, a purpose, a mission, and define core values for success for the airline. And the reason why that was so important was because he knew that in order to have a successful business operation, it wasn't just about strategy. It was about the culture. It was about putting other people, his employees namely, first, giving them the benefits that they deserved, and making them feel welcome. So some of the values that Herb Kelleher had as part of Southwest Airlines were the warrior spirit, leading from the heart, serving customers first. He was a brilliant business mind, but most importantly, because of his values-based leadership, Southwest Airlines has now enjoyed over 46 years of profitability in the airline industry, which is truly unprecedented. A lot of the public got to know Herb Kelleher through some of the more gimmicky aspects of drinking wild turkey and smoking cool cigarettes, uh, getting into an arm wrestling competition with a competitor who had accused him of stealing their slogan. <laughs> One of the great stories of, of Southwest Airlines was just a couple of years after their existence, and it's important to know that when they were first founded, they fought for over five years, or about five years, in litigation, so his background was as a lawyer. And they fought just to get into the business and into the industry, and less than two years after they had established their operations, mostly in Texas, they found a competitor in Braniff Airlines. Now, Southwest was using $26 uh, flights and Braniff Airlines had come in and literally cut that in half to $13. So what did Herb Kelleher do? What any reasonable person would do, of course. He offered a fifth of Chivas Regal Scotch to every person flying on Southwest Airlines. <laughs> he couldn't compete with Braniff Airlines price, so he tried to get to the customer's heart and into their liquor cabinet, of course. <laughs> and for that incredible period of time, Southwest Airlines became the biggest distributor of Chivas Regal Scotch in the state of Texas. That's a true story. So I think the image that he gave to the public was one of a fun-loving guy, but never underestimate the brilliance behind the way that he led the strategy that he had for Southwest Airlines. At a time when so many of the other airlines in the industry were operating from a hub and spoke model, he operated from a point to point model. Continued to believe in what he had started. There was actually a lot of simplicity in terms of the continuity and the consistency of how he ran the business at Southwest. As Leonardo da Vinci once said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And I think that despite his brilliance and incredible strategic mind, Herb Kelleher embodied that. But what I wanted to leave you with as this man who disrupted an industry and led with unbelievable authenticity was that at his core, he had a plan. He had a vision, a purpose, 
and ambition. He defined success and he led with values. All of these things which you can see today on the Southwest website and why that airline has been so successful, why so many of the employees love him and consider him in so many ways to be one of the great CEOs this country has ever had. I thought that story would make a lot of sense here with a travel-based audience, and I hope many of you were, were touched uh, along your way in terms of maybe getting to meet him and in your travels. And the story of her Kelleher marries up very well with a lot of what I'm about and what I'm here to talk about today. So the purpose of this talk is really to give you some ideas, to get your imagination going, to give you some tools, and to help you as you build your foundation personally and professionally to get some new ideas maybe to build from a values base, to define success for yourself. And especially here at the beginning of the year, I know we're almost a month in, but uh, time to lean in and revisit those resolutions from the beginning of the year. And what I'll talk about today is how to build a game plan and why so many of the most successful people, people like Herb Kelleher, game changers, who did things their own way, who led in a very unique manner, and didn't necessarily play by the rules, and yet at their core had a solid base of values, had a purpose and a defined mission for success that have enabled them to go on to do some incredible things. I thought being here in Nashville would be awesome to tell a little bit more about the story of country music and to talk about some of the people that have come to be known as the defining artists in this genre. So I wanted to ask everybody in the room, you can just shout it out, especially uh, when you think of country music and when you think of some of the legends of country music, who are the people that you think of? That's fine. Willie Nelson. Patrick Lyon. Charlie Martin. Willie Nelson. Damien Horn. <laughs> Damien Horn. <laughs> Damien Horn. <laughs> so, one thing that became very interesting to me as I learned more about the history of country music, Nashville, as they say, was built on the song. Nashville was built on hit songs. And it was backed up by a system that operated very smoothly as an assembly line would. And that system was controlled by the record labels. And the record labels were all about making hit songs. And in those hit songs, the session musicians would play the music, the songwriters would write the songs, and performers like Dolly Parton or many others would come along and sing that music. And it made Nashville and it made the record labels in this town very, very successful. So I heard a few names yelled out. I heard Dolly Parton, Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Emmy Lou Harris. Some of the legends of this industry were the people who absolutely refused to play by the rules. When they came to Nashville, the idea that they couldn't write their own music or have their own friends or bandmates play their songs didn't exactly work out for them. They wanted to do it their way and they were willing to change the game. And there were struggles along the way. Johnny Cash wasn't accepted first. But as we now look back at some of these incredible titans of country music, in a way, like Herb Kelleher and like many other game changers, they didn't play by the rules. They came in in a brash and unique way, and they forged their own path. And they became the people that we know today as the icons of country music. So as you continue to immerse yourself in the culture here in Nashville and you look back at some of the great legends like Dolly Parton, remember that these are the people that they came in and they knew that they wanted to do things their way and they made their music in such a manner that worked for them and worked for millions and millions of people and made them very successful. So breaking into the core of the talk here, one of the things for me that is such an important element of being successful is having a passion. And I would say that just the fact that all of you today are in this room speaks to the passion that you have about making your career better, your company better, this industry better. It's a commitment 
to excellence to be here, and you have a passion about the work that you do. I think it's so important to be passionate and to cultivate that inside of you as you build your goals and your game plan for this year and as you look out at the rest of your career. So what do I mean by that? When I think of passion, I think of enthusiasm. I think of having a real fire for what you do. That kind of thing that when you look around and you think about it, you just say, ah, this is this thing that gets me so excited and so kicked up that you just want to scream inside. Now, maybe not in public, maybe on your own time and behind closed doors, but that enthusiasm and that fire becomes that passion that lights up inside of you. It improves the way that you see yourself and the way that you see the work that you do. And so that passion is one of the fundamental foundations of having a great game plan, of being excited about the work that you do. And I would encourage you, in everything that you do, to think first and foremost about finding that passion for what you do. It will make you successful. It will add value and color to your life. And getting that emotion of getting excited about something really helps you on your journey. So before the talk here, uh, we passed out some worksheets at the table. And under number one, what I'd like you to do is just to take one minute. This is meant to be an interactive session to get you guys to do a little fun homework. So it shouldn't require a whole lot of thought. Why don't you just write down a couple of the things that you're passionate about that really light that fire inside of you. Just take a minute. Tacos. <laughs> Tacos don't
We, just like a business, can establish the values for ourselves that give us the core and give us the foundation to build and go on to do great things that help us to have a defined purpose and defined mission for success. Those values, like our core, once we strengthen them, enable us to be more mobile, <coughs> nimble, and agile, and enable us to do great things. So values like enthusiasm, hard work, discipline, competitive greatness, confidence, this is the foundation that we need to do great things. And I would say that in order to really know your value, you should establish your values first. All of these things, your talents, your skills, your passions and experiences, and your values, equate and equal the value that you establish for yourself. So we'll take another one minute break here. And again, I, I, hopefully this is just gonna be something that comes very instinctively to you. Write down, if you can, five values, but just write down a couple of the values that come to mind for you when you think of the foundational things that mean the most to you, that enable you to understand why you do what you do. Okay, just one minute. Coming here today is 
getting that thought, especially at the beginning of the year, to think more about results-oriented behavior and that your goals should all be aligned and leading toward the results that you're looking to get. So everything about a game plan is establishing that foundation, defining success for yourself, building smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based goals that are going to get you to where you want to be. How many of you in the room are familiar with the concept of design thinking? So I thought that the more I was building out this methodology of having a game plan that it mirrored a lot of what design thinking is about because really building that passion and values and having a purpose is really about empathizing with yourself and defining and getting into that ideating phase of defining success, having a mission, having clarity. Your goals and your action are more that prototype and testing and implementing phase that comes with design thinking. You're developing the goals that you want to achieve for 2019 and beyond, both where you are and in your personal life. And then you're putting those things into action. And I would say that if you're getting results to obviously continue what you're doing, but that testing and implementing phase when it comes to taking action is that if you're not getting the results that you want to recalibrate and revisit and come back, that's where it's so important to have those values and to have that purpose so that you're able to come back to that core center to know exactly what you can do to either accentuate your strengths or work on those weaknesses to add more value. It's a very tasty bagel right there. <laughs> One of the best lessons that I ever learned in my life came from a meeting that a friend of mine had set up for me. He told me to grab breakfast with a businessman that he knew uh, who was helping him. He was one of the board of directors at the school where he was the principal. And he said, just take this meeting. You know, I don't know what will come of it. At the time, I was looking around and wondering if I should change jobs. But I decided to meet this very successful businessman. I was living in Atlanta at the time. And we met at Goldberg's New York Deli, which initially was a little bit of an offense to my sensibilities as a native New Yorker, calling it a New York Deli in Atlanta. But the cream cheese bagel and the schmear were actually quite good. It passed the test, I must say. And as I sat down and ate breakfast with this man, I learned a little bit more about his story. I told him what I was doing. And the conversation went on, and I still wasn't totally sure exactly why I was there. Chalk it up to another one of those networking conversations that maybe didn't lead to a fruitful outcome. But we finished speaking, and he said to me, Chris, I really don't know how much I can help you. I've been out of the game for a little while. I'm 56 years old. I retired 15 years ago at the age of 41. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> this man, when he was 41 years old, sold his business. He had started a financial services company and created a lot of marketing platforms around that. He sold it to German uh, Titan Allianz for just north of $100 million. So suddenly, my ears perked up. And everything that that man began to say became gospel. Right? What he went on to tell me was, Chris, I don't know how much I can help you. I don't have a lot of connections anymore. I spend a lot of time playing golf, living a good life. What I can tell you is what made me successful and why I was able to sell my business for over $100 million. He said, I started this business when I was 31 years old, and the sole intent, the whole purpose behind this business was to eventually get bought out and sell it to somebody else. We created a unique marketing solution for financial services companies. The details are less relevant. The goods, the secret behind his success, he told me, was to create a 10-year plan for his business that started the moment of the inception of the business, and that he also had a five-year plan personally for his life that was modified and recalibrated as he went along. And he said, I never would have been able to do what I did had it not been for this 10-year plan. He said, but more significantly, it's not just about having a plan. Plans are meant to be changed. 
Plans are nothing, planning is everything, once said Dwight D. Eisenhower. What he told me was that you have to get painstakingly specific if you want to be really successful. Awesome. As much as I've talked about having a game plan, it doesn't mean a whole lot if you don't really have a routine to back it up. And that's the way that you come into every day, and especially what Hal Elrod established in his book was having a great morning routine. And so I wanted to share this acronym, especially for those of you who aren't familiar with it, because it's so easy to remember, and it's a great way to be able to back up the plan that you have for yourself. So Savers, as you can see on the screen, you start with silence. And so really what that's about is having a meditation practice, if that's something that you maybe don't already have, and being able to really get clear in your own mind and have thoughts to be able to start your day off, uh, step, start your day out with peace and quiet. It could be prayer. For those of you in the room, like me with young children, silence is one of the most valuable pieces of your day. <laughs> so for me, there's no coincidence that it begins as the top option. But having silence could be one of the first things you do when you wake up in the morning. Just spend 10 minutes and get clear about what you want to do that day to get some peace of mind, especially if the day before that you ended with thoughts racing and your mind racing and you're going through a very busy period of your job with some anxiety and stress. Having that period of meditation or silence. I use an app called Insight Timer, which I highly recommend. It's added a lot of value to my life and it's helped me gain clarity and establishing more of a routine. A, affirmations, speaking positive things over your life. So important to stay positive. It's so important to feed your conscious and subconscious mind those positive affirmations that you're going to do great things every single day. Visualization, I talked about that a little bit in the context of having a passion. And for me, visualization applies to so many of the things that we do, even preparing for this speech and visualizing being here in front of all of you, or delivering that big speech that you have in your business. Coming here, taking the lessons that you guys learned from being here for a couple of days and visualizing that as you get back to your city and state and to your business and being able to apply those. Being able to visualize yourself doing successful things is very, very important. Exercise. It could literally be done in a space like this. We're talking about jumping jacks. No, I won't demonstrate. <laughs> Push-ups, crunches, just something to get the blood flowing every morning. It doesn't necessarily have to be a gym membership. I think I've been to my gym about five times in the past year, and that's not a joke. <laughs> but, you know, working out, doing a little something to uh, just get the blood flowing every morning is really good. The R for reading, reading a great book in the morning. It could just be for 10 minutes, something to get your mind working and jogging as you get ready to start your day, and scribing, keeping a daily journal, writing down the thoughts that come to your mind, being able to look back at your day and have a little bit of a reflection will help as well. So I thought that this was a great thing to share to back up kind of having that plan. I wanted to share another uh, story that came when I was a kid. So I, I grew up just outside of New York City on Long Island, so for all the New York people in the room, What's up? <laughs> and one of the biggest uh, gifts that my parents gave to us every year, my father was from upstate New York, and he would give us the gift for our birthdays every year of a week at uh, Syracuse University basketball camp. Hi. So for our family, that was a gift of gold. I grew up in a sports-obsessed family. I have a brother uh, who works for ESPN on television. And all of us, basketball was our life. And so we'd go to this basketball camp every summer. And each day, there'd be a lecture. And one of the coaches, or maybe a former player, would show up. And one of the talks that resonated with me and stuck with me, and I think is so applicable to our lives, to what we do in business, was given by the now head basketball coach at the University of Washington. His name is Mike Hopkins. Coach Hopkins was from Southern California. And he came to Syracuse as a very lightly recruited player. They were bringing in some of the best players in the country every single year. And he barely got on the team. And he knew that in order to play, he had to do a little bit more. His talent alone was not going to get him on the court at Syracuse. Not during that time, not when they were competing every year for the Final Four. So as he talked a little bit more about his journey at Syracuse, he said, you know, I was a scrawny white kid 
barely weighed anything, and I got to Syracuse, and I realized that in order to play, I needed to contribute. He bought into the belief in the, in the uh, saying that talent, uh, when, excuse me, hard work beats talent, but talent doesn't work hard. And he started looking around, and I even talked to the coach at the time, and he said, what does our team need? What do we need to be successful? I can't dunk, I'm not a great outside shooter, but I can do all the little things. I can get the rebounds, I can dive on the floor for loose balls, a lot of sports metaphors here, of course. But I can do all of those little things, like forcing turnovers and making sure that we win basketball games. He ended up becoming a four-year starter at Syracuse. And I ask you to think about that in the context of where you are right now. So, so many of you in this room have a lot of talent, but I can always tell you that talent alone will not get you there. It's those little things that are going to make the difference between being successful and getting ahead in your career. So when we talk about leadership development, one of the things that I always look for is, you know, go to that all hands meeting that maybe isn't mandatory. Listen a little bit closer to what your boss is saying, to what leadership is saying at quarterly meetings, and find out what your business, what your company, what this industry needs. And so the lesson I learned from Coach Hopkins is that a lot of the times, it's a lot more about the fine details than just what meets the eye on the surface. Focus on those little things, because all of those little things will add up to make you more successful where you are now in your career. Big time growth. 
working and living in New York at the time, I was using a train ride on the Long Island Railroad, which I know Stephen would certainly understand uh, being from the Long Island and New York chapter, but using that time to my advantage. Looking at the periods of your day to realize these are the things that I can do to add more value and more time to my day and to eliminate the excuses and to prioritize to be able to be more successful and to eliminate those I don't have enough time or I'm worried about what other people will think. I think great leaders put excuses aside and keep moving forward. They believe in themselves, that foundation of having faith and confidence and really believing in what you do and being willing to eliminate excuses will help keep moving you forward toward your goals. We're almost there with the worksheet. Uh, number four, what are some of the excuses for you that come to mind that, and you think about in your personal and professional life? What are the three biggest excuses that just immediately come to mind? Take a minute. Needless to say, very important. 
But being honest with yourself, and as you take stock at the beginning of the year here, looking back at your resolutions and looking forward to all that you want to accomplish, being honest as you set these goals, and hopefully as you move out from this meeting and you get back home and you look at all the things that you want to accomplish this year, being honest about your strengths, all of the things that you're looking to do. And as I say the two C's, commitment and consistency. In order to start, you have to be committed, uh, excuse me, you have to be committed. But to continue to finish and continue to keep driving through, you have to be consistent. Having a game plan is great, but continu uh, continually executing off of it and being consistent is what's going to make you great. All right, the very last time out here. Um, what are some of the goals? Maybe you started this already in the past month. What are some of the goals that you're looking to achieve this year, personally and professionally? Jot a few things down and we'll take one minute.
he lost all $50,000 of her money. So at the age of 30, working toward building a dream over a period of seven years, Sue Zorman was still a waitress at Buttercup Bakery, except now she was broke and she didn't know what to do. So she took some time to regroup. She actually went to that same Merrill Lynch office in Oakland, California and applied for a job. She decided if I was going to get cons and I was going to be taken to the cleaners by this man, I needed to start learning a little bit more about finance. I needed to learn more about how to invest my own money and how to be successful. After a rigorous interview process, she got the job. And later, while she was at that Merrill Lynch office, decided to sue Merrill Lynch. <laughs> she ended up getting all of her money back, plus interest. She worked there for another little while, eventually went on to Prudential, and then started her own financial services company. Later went on to television, has written numerous New York Times bestsellers. And so the person we know today wasn't obviously the person who was conned out of that money. She was somebody who absolutely refused to take no for an answer. Great leaders do not let roadblocks, do not let temporary setbacks stop them. Successful people, same thing. Sue Zorman was not going to let one person ruin her dream. As she moved along, that dream manifested itself from obviously starting a restaurant into becoming one of the most successful and incredible financial minds in this country. And I thought that her story applied value here in that the persistence to continue to keep going, to continue to keep doing and believe what you're doing is that it's going to lead to results and to not let anything stop you as you build those goals and keep moving forward in your careers and in your work with the GPTA. Having that perspective, we talked about in the Sabres uh, acronym there of, of scribing and keeping a journal of reflection, <coughs> determining what's working for you, but what is best to maybe put behind you? What are those things to have a short-term memory about and put behind? I'm such a big believer in celebrating the wins, and it's why and it makes sense when you have goals, when you set very specific goals, to take time to celebrate what you've accomplished. I'm not talking about getting complacent. I'm talking about taking that 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe it's just that one night, using that as that marker to measure your success, to celebrate what you've accomplished, and to continue to keep moving forward, to have the nerve to boldly try again. One of my favorite stories comes from music. The Beatles, after making so many successful records, and even Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, one of the greatest albums of all time, they talked about how that just wasn't enough for them. They still went on and they still had Let It Be and Abbey Road up their sleeve. And you can think about that in the context of so many successful people in this industry and in other industries, that one success isn't enough. It's the desire to keep getting more and keep getting more and to keep building, celebrate those wins and keep moving forward. <laughs> oh, God, not him again. <laughs> Because despite how much I don't like that team, I love this man right here. And in five days, he's going to be playing in his, I think, 85th Super Bowl or something like that. It's actually nine. But when I think about the greatest quarterback of all time and one of the greatest athletes, certainly in the history of this country, I think of a story that he told a couple years ago. Despite all of the successes that he's had in his career, before the start of the NFL season a couple years ago, he shed a little bit more light and personal insight into the man that he is. As some of you know, he attended the University of Michigan. And while he was there, he had become friendly with the longtime equipment manager at the University of Michigan, John Fall. So one of the stories that Tom Brady tells is that 
During his time there, uh, this equipment manager had been at the school for 40 years, and in the history of college football, Michigan, one of the winningest programs, won numerous Big Ten championships, uh, national championships. <laughs> and as he came back to the school several years ago, and he still found a long, uh, long time equipment manager there, John Falk, he said, John, as I walked through this locker room, even having played here, it's truly unbelievable to see all these banners of champions. As you look around, John, what is the banner? What is the championship? What is the one that means the most to you? And so that man looked at Tom Brady and he said, the next one, that's the championship that I'm concerned about. That's my favorite, that next one. Anyone who knows what he's accomplished both on a personal level and on a team level, and even reading a cool story about him a couple days ago, how when a former player of the Patriots was upset and dismayed that he hadn't made the Pro Bowl, Tom Brady said, hey man, it ain't about Pro Bowls around here. It's about Super Bowls, it's about rings. And it's keeping that championship successful mindset, but more importantly, it's taking the time to celebrate the wins, as maybe they will in five days, we'll find out. But Tom Brady, like a lot of great leaders, will immediately move forward and immediately move on. And even at the age of 41, has promised to play longer, and is promising that he will always look forward to that next one. And I use that other sports metaphor again to illustrate the importance of continuing to have a future-seeking mindset in your leadership. To be successful, to keep driving forward, you're always looking forward to that next big goal in front of you. So to come full circle, I thought I'd pay some homage here to Dolly and, and of course to Merv Keller. So as Dolly Parton said, if your actions create a legacy that inspires others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, then you are an excellent leader. And the wisdom of Herb Gallagher, if you're crazy enough to do what you love for a living, then you're bound to create a life that matters. So I ask you to think about and leave you with that legacy. Hopefully, as you continue to build out your own game plan, and you take that back with you and you apply it where you are, keep thinking more about the legacy that you want to leave in your industry, in your personal and professional life. Hopefully that leaves a lasting imprint on you and you can get a little bit deeper and think more about what that purpose is for you. So I thank you so much for having me here today. It's been a real honor as uh, I was able to get to speak to some of you over the last couple of days and I'd love to, get to, uh, to continue that conversation here after the event. I'm gonna give away some books uh, and do some questions and answers here, but uh, just very uh, thankful and grateful for you to have me here today. And I look forward to uh, hopefully continuing the conversation and wish all of you much success moving forward. Thank you. Given 
the work that I do as a coach and as a writer, I, I put blocks on my day for time for just creativity. You know, the best ideas, the best things that I come up with are when I have a really clear mind. But I also do operate uh, off of a schedule. I mean, I, I just personally, just from having been in the business world, and I, I think maybe most people here use Outlook as, as um, you know, a previous job that I had a couple of years ago, I had uh, worked with a consultant who used to say to me, you know, get off your butt and get out to lunch and go meet people. And so that's another element of planning where you maybe block a one hour time interval uh, once, twice a week, if, if time permits in your job, where you're going out and you're networking and you're meeting with the smartest people in your industry, people that you can learn from. I, I think that's how you become an expert. One of the ways that I became a better writer and learned more about the writing process was by talking to successful writers. In the coaching work that I do, I surrounded myself with you know, really smart people. I, I, I always tend to think in, in terms of sports metaphors, Growing up as a kid, the athlete that I loved the most was Magic Johnson. And one of the things that he used to say is, like, I always surrounded myself with better people, better, you know, so I think that when you surround yourself with other experts, it kind of comes in by osmosis, but having a passion and using that emotional intelligence to have a curiosity around learning more about that thing that you want to be the expert in, and just continuing to put yourself out there and confidently advancing your ideas to people of influence who are willing to listen, we're then going to give you that platform to be able to express those to more people. Thank you very much. That was um, outstanding to, to listen to today. I had two things. And you sports fans, please don't get mad by this, but I'm just curious. If the Patriots were not in the Super Bowl, would you have used Tom Brady as an example? And if no, then, or yeah, no, then who would you have used? <laughs> So, my wife is in the room, and, and interestingly enough, um, nine days ago, as I was watching the AFC Championship, and I, I'm not a huge NFL fan, I, but, but I always watch the playoff games, and, and I was sitting there, it just it felt like a dagger going through the heart watching the Chiefs lose that game. But I would have used him, uh, and again, I think that his mindset as an athlete, so I didn't use that word much in the speech today, but it's a word that's very prevalent in the world that I live in, in personal development, having a mindset, but just being positive, being resolute. Like, what's so amazing about Tom Brady is that whenever he finishes playing, we're gonna look back and say, man, that guy won a lot, that guy won a lot. You know what he also did a lot? He lost a lot. And even for those in the room who remember were fortunate enough to see Michael Jordan, you know, one of the quotes that I used in the book it's one of my favorite quotes in life. You know, I have failed time and time and time and time again, which is why I succeed. Michael Jordan said that. I think most people in the room would agree he might be the greatest athlete any of us have ever seen. And so I think you learn, we learn, I have learned so much from adversity, from failure, from setbacks. And as time has gone on in my life, I mean, there's, there's, it's crazy. There's times where adversity strikes and I say, this isn't really a bad thing because I'm going to grow from this. And if I embrace it, I'm going to come out better on the other end. So I would have used him. It honestly makes me look a lot better that the Patriots won that game, even though I didn't want to. <laughs> Chris, right over here. Hi. Um, it was such a great, I love the title, The Value of You, because I really see that, um, People, so many people, especially in my life and around, I really see that they base their value based on what somebody else thinks of them. And it's really, what's a great, um, but I know over time, that takes time to really get the value of you. So do you uh, offer longer term seminars? Do you, you know, do you offer things that actually help people, what you were saying before, commit the two C's, commitment and, and consistency? Do you offer things like that that actually support others to go to be committed and consistent to themselves to learning the value of themselves. Yeah, I and mean, that's something that I've been developing more over the past year and doing with business. I live in Charleston, but I do travel, and I certainly started working with, uh, even the previous company that I worked for was doing a lot of leadership development work around emotional intelligence and values-based leadership. Um, and as I put this presentation together, I'm sure a lot of you realized, you know, I, interestingly enough, uh, had, had started preparing for this back in December, actually right before her Kelleher passed away. Um, and actually, as he, after that, I, I researched more about his life and I was like, wow, you know, this, this man represents everything to me of who I want to be in 
what I stand for and what so much of my personal experience has been. I, I think you will not find a better example of authentic leadership and values-based leadership. And so it's just a big part of what I am and what I believe in. And I got that foundation in the consulting world. Like I said, it was astonishing to me to realize right out of graduate school, I'm sitting at this orientation at 7 in the morning, and I'm like, blah, 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 right? right? And then all of a sudden, I'm like, wait, we're going to get evaluated, and our annual assessments are going to be based on our values. And then finding out that Southwest Airlines does that, why it's so important to live by values and to apply it both in our business careers, but also personally, you know, to my family life. And I just feel like I talked a lot about purpose, and I know I probably got sick of me saying it after a while, but you know, having that why you do what you do, I think that has to be rooted in values of things that you believe in. And I'm just such a big believer in terms of empowerment and emotional intelligence that never, ever, ever let anybody define those things for you. You have to do it for yourself. And I think that when you do that work, you'll realize other people respect you so much more. They know that you stand for something uh, that is based in integrity and honesty. Uh, and when you just live your life with kindness and respect, it goes such a long way. And I meant every word that I said here at the beginning of the talk. You know, it's, it's this industry, every step along the way that I've been touched in terms of you know, airline travel and hotels. And, um, the thing that always comes back is so many of the people in the travel industry uh, make for memorable experiences. We hear that term a lot now is make it a memorable experience. You know, that's what people remember. It's that holding the door. It's that you know, willingness to do those extra things that aren't part of the job description that really matters. So, um, very long-winded answer. So, um, I tend to talk a little bit, but yes, I, I do do that work, and, and it's it's the work that's nearest and dearest to my heart. You know, I do a lot of talks now around emotional intelligence and how those things tie into authentic and values-based leadership. I, I just a big part of the way is having that foundation, and I think uh, again, it's a lot of people just jump into that execution phase. So I came from a background of management consulting where. You know, we'd establish uh, projects and it was, you know, you have to define that. You have to do those things in the beginning. If you didn't, you'd fail. And I just think, why can't we do that personally? Sometimes, you know, I used to find early in my life, in my career, I would just jump right into things. But when you define success, when you do that values-based work and you have a plan, you're going to give yourself the commitment and the consistency to sustain over a long period of time as you begin executing and getting to a, a, an end goal. All right, so we have time for one more question. Hi, Melissa from Austin. Um, and this is actually a question that you can answer fast. Um, what is uh, one of the things that you do every morning to get yourself up and going? Um, great question. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, at this, at this point in my life, I, I consider, you know, the biggest blessing in my life to be my children. So um, it's going into those little guys' room and giving them a kiss. So, you know, even thinking about it, it gets me a little emotional. But uh, the two little guys that you see on the screen there are, you know, why I do what I do. So uh, it's going and seeing them. <laughs> I think that helps bring out my passion and enthusiasm to tie it back to uh, Sabres. So. Awesome. Thank you so much for your